But there came a great storm out of the west, and out of that storm Ulmo, the lord of waters, arose in majesty and spoke to Tor as he stood beside the sea. And Ulmo bade him depart from that place and seek out the hidden kingdom of Gondolin. And he gave Tor a great cloak to mantle him in shadow from the eyes of his enemies. Greetings and well met, my friends. Yoisten here, and I hope you all are doing well, wherever you are in Middle-earth. I'm so excited to finally be bringing you all the story of Tour and the fall of Gondolin as told within the Silmarillion. Before we begin, I'd like us all to remember the Professor today, as Tolkien passed away on this day 45 years ago. Thank you for everything, sir. You will always be remembered. Now, let's begin our discussion on the fall of Gondolin. We begin our story with a battle. Hur, the brother of Hurin, was slain in the Battle of Unnumbered Tears in 472 of the First Age, as the two kinsmen allowed their friend Turgon, the new High King of the Noldor, to escape the onslaught and keep Gondolin a secret from the servants of Morgoth. However, Hur had a son, Tur, who was born in the winter of the year of that battle. Tur was born in the wilds of Mithrim, the southeast part of Hithlum, and he was fostered by Anael of the Grey Elves, who still lived in the hills of Mithrim. Tor's mother, Ryan, would pass away from grief after leaving her son with the elves. Sixteen years later, when Tor was coming into manhood, the elves decided to leave the caves of Androth in Mithrim where they lived, and they journeyed south, heading towards the havens of Sirion. However, Tor and his friends were overtaken by orcs and Easterlings. Tor himself would be taken captive by Lorgan, the leader of the Easterlings of Hithlum, and so he stayed enslaved for three years, but Tor would eventually escape and go back to his home of the Caves of Androth. Tor would live there by himself, and he would become an outlaw against the Easterlings, his former captors. Lorgan would then set a price upon Tor's head, and the son of Hor would dwell in the Caves of Androth for four more years, making him twenty-three when Ulmo, the Vala of the Seas, put the desire in Tor's heart to leave those caves and his battles against the Easterlings behind and journey west. Tor left his home in secret, and he would eventually find the Gate of the Noldor, built by King Torgon's people long before. And so he passed through a dark tunnel beneath the mountains and went across the Kirth Nynaeach, the Rainbow Cleft, finally coming west into Nevrast, where many elves under Torgon had originally settled in Middle-earth but have since left that place. Tor looked upon the great sea of Belagar, and it kindled his love for the great bodies of water in the earth. And so Tor dwelt there by himself, for the summer of that year, 495 of the First Age. And in autumn, seven great swans flew over him, and he realized that he tarried there for too long. Tor would then go to Venyamar beneath Mount Taurus, and inside he found a halberk, helm, sword, and shield, left by King Turgon years before through the will of Ulmo. Tor took up these great armaments and went down to the shore of the sea, and suddenly a great storm came over him. Out of the storm, Lord Ulmo of the Seas came forth to speak with the man. He bade the son of Hor depart these lands for Gondolin, giving him a warning to deliver to High King Turgon. He gave a cloak to hide Tor from his enemies as well. Tor left Ulmo, turning towards his mission. Outside of the walls of Vinyamar, Tor met an elf named Faronwe, who had once been a messenger of Turgon. Faronwe was one of the mariners to set out west, hoping to find Valinor and beg aid from the Valar. But, unlike his friends, Faronwe was the only elf left alive, and that was only because Ulmo wanted him to guide Tor to Gondolin. The Valar would not hear the pleas of the Free Peoples, unless one came who represented all of the children of Iluvatar, not just elves or men. We will eventually see this exact savior in Arendil Half-Elven, when he and his wife Elwing go to Valinor with the Silmaril, convincing the Valar to help the Free Peoples. Anyway, getting back to our story, Faronwe led Tour away from Venumar and Nevrast, coming to the pools of Irvin, where the passage of the dragon Glaurong was easily seen, as these pools were along Glaurong's passage to siege Nargothrond. At this location, Tour and Faronwe witnessed one tall man, clad in black and bearing a black sword, pass them by, heading north without saying a word. This man was Torin Torembar, the son of Hurin and the cousin of Tur. 
as he was under the spell of Glaurong heading toward Hithlum during the events of his own tale. I'll be honest, I kind of geeked out when I read this moment a few days ago, as this is such a small but cool cameo in the story of Tour, even if the two characters didn't know who the other was. After this, Varanwe and Tour continued to the encircling mountains, where at last they found the hidden door of Gondolin by the power and grace of Ulmo. They were made prisoners by elven guards and were taken up the dry river Orfalk Echor, where seven gates protected the valley of Tumladen. Tour and Varanwe were brought before Ecthelion of the Fountain, who was the warden of the Great Gate at the end of the road, and the original owner of the Sword Orchrist. Tour cast off his cloak and revealed the armaments that Torgon had left in Vinyamar, and so it was known that Tour had indeed been sent from Ulmo. Ecthelion let the trumpets of his people sing, and distantly, within the Jewel of Gondolin, trumpets echoed back. Tour rode across the valley to the city, and within he observed the splendor of the elves. He found his way to the Tower of the King, and he saw, quote, the images of the two trees of Valinor, end quote. Tour afterwards stood before High King Torgon, with his nephew Meglin on his right side, and Torgon's daughter Idril Celebrindil on his right. The elves marveled at Tour, as he bore the appearance of a man, but spoke the words of Ulmo that came to him in that time. He warned Torgon that the curse of Mandos was soon to come to its fulfillment, when all of the works of the Noldor would fail. Tor advised Torgon to depart Gondolin and lead his people to the havens of Sirion and the sea. Torgon pondered these words, but had become too proud, too trusting of his city that resembled fair Tyrion in the Undying Lands, and he forewent the advice of Lord Ulmo. As Torgon and his people had experienced the Nurnaith Arnodiad, or the Battle of Unnumbered Tears, the elves of that kingdom wanted to never again mingle in the affairs with the world and peoples outside of the encircling mountains. Their land was secret and strong, and Torgon believed it would remain hidden from Morgoth's spies. Torgon would also agree with his nephew Meglin in matters concerning the city's protection, over Tor and his warnings, as Meglin's counsel matched his own. Still, Torgon remembered the curse of Mandos all too well, and he feared treachery from his own people. Thus, the main gates going to and from Gondolin were blocked, and none were to leave Gondolin for peace or war, while the city still stood. By that time, Thorondor, the Lord of the Great Eagles, brought word of the fall of Thingol and Doriath, but Torgon stopped listening to the pains of the outside world, and he swore to never again march at the side of any son of Feanor ever again. And so, Torgon was truly set in his ways, and he did not take heed of Ulmo's warnings. But what of Tor? Well, the man of the House of Hador would remain in the city, and he was enamored by it and its people. He learned much of their histories and lores, and eventually Idril fell in love with him, and he would with her. Meglin, Idril's cousin, became all the more jealous, as he desired her, the heir of Gondolin, above all. But Tor had grown so high in the favor of Torgon after seven years in Gondolin, that the king did not refuse their marriage. He also remembered the words of Tor's father, quote, Yet if it stands but a little while, then out of your house shall come the hope of elves and men. This I say to you, Lord, with the eyes of death, though we part here forever, and I shall not look on your white walls again. From you and from me a new star shall arise. Farewell. The new star could be interpreted as Arendil, son of Tur and Idril, the heir of both houses, and the savior of elves and men both by his deeds. And so there was a great feast to celebrate the union of valiant Tur and graceful Idril. Tur had won the love of the people, except for Meglin and his secret followers. And so we see the second union of love between elves and men throughout Tolkien's Legendarium. And this is where we will end today's video, while the tone is still uplifting. One of the lessons from today's episode is, when we feel the call to make a positive difference, small or large in the world, we must take it, just as Tor does and will continue to do, as we'll see next week with the coming of Morgoth and his minions to disrupt the peaceful lives of those in Gondolin. Thank you all so much for watching, I hope you guys enjoyed today's episode. I know I did making it. If you did, please hit that like button and share this video with a friend. 
Also, please check out my videos on Torgon and the Children of Horin if you haven't already, as they relate to what was discussed today. I'll leave links to those, as well as our Facebook, Twitter, Patreon, and merch in the description, so please check all of those out. Let me know your thoughts on the events in today's episode, and also let me know what you think of Tour. I believe that he should be known as one of the most valiant heroes throughout Tolkien's works, as he goes far out of his way to save others. Please don't forget to subscribe to join the Men of the West and all of the Free Peoples today, and I'll see you guys again next weekend with part two of The Fall of Gondolin as told in the Silmarillion. Also, please feel free to check out the source material that I'm using for these videos in the Silmarillion chapter of Tour and The Fall of Gondolin. As always, guys, thank you all so much for joining me on this adventure. It means so much to me. Until the next one, my friends.